My guest in the Nematayon today is Dr. Camelia Elias, and together we are spinning a yarn. Camelia, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much. You're a scholar, a writer, cartomancer, sand practitioner. It's a wide range. <laughs> it's a wide range, but you know, it's it's there is always a um a system to this madness, you know. <laughs> what is my kind of madness is is I like to think it's very well calibrated, you see. <laughs> and I kind of I'm I've always found it easy to move between disciplines. So that has been one of my uh great fortunes, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Your your books on the tarot are uh, one of the best I know, and um, I'm honored to have you here. Uh, Camelia, what has been your favorite childhood story? Thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you for asking that question. You know, first I thought, no way, <laughs> I can't answer that, <laughs> because, you know, I, I have always been an avid uh, reader of uh, fairy tales yeah so since we are with that world and you asked me what about what you know you know your favorite tale fairy tale and i thought that there is no way in hell i can answer that uh but because there is a context you know i thought yes i can answer you know <laughs> you wanted me to to pick a story that somehow is related to magic you know or at least what we are doing here you know uh, pract practicing magic you know even, even when we practice zen you know <laughs> We are still kind of maintaining some uh, magical awareness, and uh, and I and I it didn't really it didn't take me long, you know, to actually think about the one story that I think is um, the best, you know, in illustrating the principle, you know, in in magic, and that is called fake it till you make it. <laughs> And, you know, for this, I even thought, yes, I never have an occasion to, sh to show off, you know, but I mean, just let me, let me show you the, uh, this miserable, miserable books. I mean, look at these things. I mean, this is the state. Once these books used to be brand new and I bought them with my own pocket money when I was like seven or eight. <laughs> That's like 50 years ago, yeah, almost. So, um, so um, they are written in Romania. In Romanian, because I'm a native of uh, of Romania, so I grew up in Romania, but I came to Denmark uh, 34 years ago, so that's a long time. Uh, still, the reason I hold them here is because, and it's a, they are part of a series that 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 is called, and I think they published about 50 of them or so. So I have here volume uh, 21, 22, and two. So you know, I don't know why I ended up with these three in particular. Um, I can't recall, you know, but there, there's a fun story about how, how I got them to Denmark from Romania, you know, so I thought I, I got to tell the story before I actually share with you <laughs> the one that's in, that's in, the, uh, it's, it's in these books. Um, so when I, when I came to Denmark, I actually came here as a refugee, you know, so, so this, I, I fled the, the communist Romania right before the regime fell. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so I had to go through all the motions, you know, I got the, I got to the police, you know, because I had to to declare that I, you know, I wanted now to be considered a refugee. So, you know, and you have to apply for political asylum. So the first thing that they do is that they search you, <laughs> you know, like they search you because they, they, they ask for all your papers. I ha literally had with me one canvas bag that was not bigger than, I don't know, like this. I had one canvas bag and I had one set of uh, clothes that change, put for change. I had no idea where exactly I was going to land and I'm not going to spend time to telling that story. Uh, and in addition to my clothes, I had these three books. <laughs> and you know, like, yeah, I, would, I don't even say, I don't need to say as God is my witness, you know, because I actually have the Danish police as my witness, you know, they made a record of what my canvas bag um, contained. And I, when I, f I fled, you know, so I donned my best, most luxurious fur coat. It was in, in winter and I looked like a million dollars, you know. <laughs> So I go there and say, hello, I would like to apply for political asylum, right? So then these three women, they show up because, you know, you are a woman and they, they do a body search, actually. So, you know, so so then it's women that do it mm -hmm. uh, if you are a woman. 
So, so you know, so I could just tell they took a good look at me and they, they like sized me up, you know, and they looked at my fur, you know, <laughs> and they, and then, and then they search my bag and then they take out these books and they look, they look like this, right? You can see that these have been read again and again. Um, and then, and then they started flicking through them because they thought, okay, this one can't be the poorest. So she didn't leave Romania because she was poor. <laughs> And I could just read it on their faces, you know, and I, and I kept like, yeah, keep talking. It, and they were actually talking. I did, I couldn't speak a word of Danish, but I could just tell that they were uh, making a comment uh, as to my uh, status and what I what I was. And I mean, I was just 21 at the time. Uh, so, but, you know, they were making all these assumptions and I just gave them the look, you know, like, you keep talking, you know, you are making all the wrong assumptions I can tell. <laughs> So they flicked through my books there and then they could see that, mm, okay, they didn't contain any, any strange uh, uh, secrets, uh, no, no spying. And... Yeah, 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 you know, no spying. And I, and I tried to reassure them. So I, I, uh, we, we spoke English and, and then I said to them, it's just a set of, of stories. So of course, in their minds, I could just tell that they couldn't come, it couldn't, they couldn't compute, you know, like. How you flee Romania with the canvas bag and you want to be a refugee and you you ha you, you look like a million dollars, <laughs> million dollars, I don't know, luxury something, aristocrat. And then you have this, this rubbish books, you know, <laughs> and then you call them a set of fairy tales. It's like, who the hell lives a country with a set of fairy tales? Okay, I did that. So now the magic of it. So I still read fairy tales. Um, I never stopped. You know, and in in the context of magic, I thought, which if which ca could I pick? I can pick so many, but uh, this is a classic one, and it's very likely that most people know it. And it's called the Master Cat or Puss in Boots. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's for the Carter in German. Yeah. Okay. So then you know. So let me just summarize very briefly. Uh, so this is this is the story. It's a, an Italian story actually that goes back to Giovanni Straparola around 18, eight, uh, uh, 1450. He wrote it. <laughs> mm. So about one hundred years later, Charles Perrault uh, in France popularized it because he also made some additions, and then that's the one I grew up with. And look at this; it's all in rags, but I, it's like it's here, you know. So I even uh, made a note of it. That's so why I gotta show it. So in Romanian, it's called Motanul Inkalzat, you know, so it's like the, uh, the, the tomcat um, in boots, yeah. Now, the fun part about the story is that it starts as usual, you know, three sons, they, they inherit uh, their parents, and then the first two, they get everything, while the third one gets nothing, except for the cat. So, of course, he starts lamenting and says, oh, yeah, wow, the first two brothers, you know, one of them got the mill and the other one got the mule. And if they get together, they can make a living. But what about me? I can't really offer anything, you know, like I only got this goddamn cat. And what can the cat do? Um, so he thought this my misfortune is is done. Right. So the cat there uh, uh, in the in the in the wings, you know, was listening to his lamentation and he started he started talking. Uh, and he said, listen, master, if you just take a minute to listen to what I have to say, <laughs> you may be deeming in the end that your misfortune will, is not so. It will, I will make sure to turn it into great fortune. So, okay, in a, Straparola calls his character, you know, Costantino Fortunato. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so this is, so Charles Perrault didn't keep the names, you know, but I like to go to the origin, to the source, you know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Like, of Fortunato, course, Const the, the one who is Of course, the one with the fortune. Yeah. But Constantino, that's also, it has to do with Constante, you know, being constant, you know. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, so if, if, if there is anything good for this character, then it's his faith. He was, he was constant in his faith for fortunes yeah <laughs> so you know so but he he couldn't manage anything else right so he is just this you know uh inno innocent uh, person who is not very smart uh but the cat was yeah so so this is a story of cunning true cunningness you know and it goes like that so he says please commission a pair of boots for me like strong boots nice leather boots and i need a sack okay so Constantino Fortunato, or no name, you know, in, in Perol's rendition, 
uh, acts on faith and gives the cat the boots and the sack. So then the next thing that, that happens, the cat goes out and, and you know, it can't uh, hunt for bigger game, you know. Uh, so he decides, I need some uh, rabbits <laughs> or I need some, some bigger game, you know. Um, and uh, for that, I need to, to invent, a, a, to plot a strategy or I need some tactics, you know. So he thinks the, the sack is enough, you know, and my, my boots will help me to go all sorts of places where I, I can't access otherwise. Um, so very commonsensical, very logical. Yeah. <laughs> so he goes and fills his sack with some barley, parsley, I mean, all the magical ingredients, right? And then the next thing that happens, he goes to the to a nearby farm that um, raises rabbits, and he thinks one of the rabbits is gonna be dumb enough, and he will and he yeah it will enter the sack. Remember, I use the pronouns here because in this in this world we are always with the anthropomorphization of of uh, or all animals animals are anthropomorphic. So sure enough, he's correct. One of the rabbits enters the sack. You know, it wants to eat the stuff in it. The cat quickly you know uh ties the sack and now the next thing that happens he goes to the king he requests an audience with the king he gets he 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 gets it granted he enters and says my master the marquis of caravas <laughs> well, sends you this game with compliments greetings from our house and the king says oh well thank you so much for this attention wonderful wonderful all right, so the cat, you know, now is in business, right? So now what happens next? Okay, so the next, so to, uh, even a seven-year-old uh, begins to understand that there's something uh, interesting here that happens at the level of ritual. Because the next thing that happens, the cat begins to repeat this pr uh, procedure. Um, so he goes out and hunts for the bigger game, partridge, you know, more rabbits, whatever, you know, small, small stags or whatever. Um, and he delivers all of it to the king. And then the story actually gives us the exact recipe for how you go about it. It says, at least twice a week for two to three months, <laughs> the master cat did this. Okay, so now he's a familiar with the king. And, you know, because he's a familiar with the king, he, you know, he also gets to hear something about the king's whereabout so the master cat is now also a very uh, masterful at pr or he, he pays attention so he hears one day that the king is going to take the carriage with his most beautiful in the land daughter <laughs> and then he says okay now it's the time to strike and he goes uh, home and instructs his ma young master and he says okay you're gonna go down to the river and take a swim and you don't have to ask me anything just do what i say <laughs> um and just you just take a swim and just you know and we'll take it from there so at the time when the king passes with his carriage and the and the beautiful princess in it you know the cat starts shouting oh my god my god my my the marquis of carabas you know <laughs> is about to drown you know so the king is something like you know the familiarity right oh marquis of carabas oh this is the one who's been sending me all the stuff you know for three months i've been eating his stuff Okay, so um, so he stops the carriage, obviously, and he immediately sends uh, his servants and he to, to help out. Um, so the cat, of course, he goes to the to the to the to the to, to the king, then and says, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I can't even present my my master to you because you know, can you believe it? <laughs> While he was drowning, the thieves came along and stole his clothes." <laughs> And the king, of course, you know, he's, he, he takes it all in earnest and says, oh, that's not good. So he instructs his servants to give him the best clothes. And what happens next? The young man gets installed, now donning the costume, no more rags. And being the hunk young man that he was, I mean, instantly the young do the daughter, you know, she starts look, giving him the looks, you know. And the cat is like observing and says, okay, we are in business. So then the, the, the king, because he feels he owes the young man, says, well, you know, you are welcome to, to take this uh, stroll, as it were, in the, in the carriage with us through the land. And, uh, you know, just to converse a little bit. I have to show my own gratitude. So they go in the carriage and then they just to, to see the sights. Yeah, the cat goes ahead. So as the cat goes ahead, 
we meet all these uh, peasants do, tiling the earth and all that. So, um, so he instructs now the peasants when he gets there, the, the, king's, the king's carriage is coming. If he asks uh, uh, about um, uh, the owner of, the, of this land, you have to tell him that it's the Marquis of Carabas that owns all of this. If you don't do that, the greatest misfortune is going to befall you, the cat. <laughs> so the cat now engages with threat. Yeah. So often I'm thinking like, okay, if it's not a threat, then it's the promise for heavens, you know. So in this case, it was the threat that did it. <laughs> okay, so sure enough, so his plan works. The king comes and then everybody is toiling us. And then the king asks, so who does this land belong to? And they, they all are Marquis of Carabas. <laughs> So the so the king now like oh my boy you seem like very well off you know and such a young man and you already uh, it, you seem to to really be a good manager of everything so he gets to be impressed so you know so this repeats again so we have that repetition right mm. so it, it repeats and then the cat gets to the to a, to a big castle and says now this is like the this is the, the fight, the trump, you know, now we need to, to, I need to trump this because this is the final piece of the puzzle yeah, that will ensure that, you know, the, the greatest success will happen, which is obviously, you know, the, the aim be, being to get the young man to marry the princess, right? So, uh, so they get to the castle, this belongs to an ogre, you know, like a monster, yeah, <laughs> one that was very smart as it turned out. So the cat goes in there and, and says, well, I had to, to, to try and pay my respects because, you know, everybody heard of you so the cat begins with a strategy of flattery you know <laughs> can we begin to understand the morale of this yeah the story you know? so flattery like first you lie then you flatter somebody somebody will be if not uh, greedy for uh, wealth then they will be greedy for praise so the monster wanted to be validated, you know. <laughs> Lo and behold, so many of us do, uh, even now, f 500 years after Straparola. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, imagine. Uh, some things never change. So, uh, so, you know, so the cat gets to the, to the, to the ogre's castle. He uh, pays his flattering uh, respects. And then he says, I heard that part of your, uh, your c capability is to turn, transform yourself into anything, like a big lion or, you know, the big. And then the ogre says, yes, you bet. And then, and then the cat, you know, being the, the cunning cat that it was, he says, well, I have to, you know. And then the ogre instantly, because it damaged, you know, says, I'll show you, you know. So he turns himself into a lion. And so it was so convincing that the cat hides somewhere, you know. After that, he turns back to his uh, to his uh, uh, figure, and then the cat says, "Yeah, well, that was impressive. You most definitely are the thing." It's uh, <laughs> the ogre now is like, you know, his ego is so he feels so good about himself. Uh, so the next thing that happens is that he says, "Yeah, this is all good with the big animals, but you know." I have a hard time believing that you being already so big, you can also turn into a small thing, like, you know, like a, like a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> and the ogre, you know, already like he wants to show off. He, he turns himself into a mouse. And what happens next? The cat eats it. That's, okay. That, 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 That's... The, the very same motive we know from so many stories, like uh, Taliesin and... Uh, uh, the the cauldron of carriage and, and and so on it's that's it that's yeah, it yeah yeah so you know so it, so from there i mean it, we pretty much kind of guess what uh, what happens you know but, but the king uh, reaches the castle and then uh, of course the ogre was uh expecting some of his own friends guests you know for a, the, the dinner was already uh put, put on the table so the king then gets to feast on 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 all of that and it was all <laughs> all of this belonged to the marquis of carabas so the next thing that happens it was almost like the king begging the young man to to take his daughter because that's such a good match you know <laughs> <laughs> and so the story ends there now uh why did i pick the story i mean i i remember that and even to this day and i love to tell it you know and it's it's such an incredible story in terms of how we understand magic a lot of people go and invest a lot of money in, in magic courses or in, in, in marketing courses, mind you, you know, for business. And I'm like, man, just read the master cat. It's all there. You know, first you assume an identity. It doesn't give, mean anything. What can, you can call yourself whatever the fuck you want. Call yourself that. 
then you know after you establish your identity engage with some proclamations you know you have to be proclamatory about your you know like your name you know you have to establish it you have to you have to you know uh uh, shout from the top of your lungs if you can hear is the Marquis of Carabas, you know, uh, uh, and all of that. Uh, you do that then for at least three months, right? Yeah. <laughs> for a three, and then, of course, with the proclamation, you have to either engage with some threat, you know, whoever group you want to target, you know, you ha either have to promise them the heaven, yeah, or you know. Yeah, the seven figure sum for your business, I'm gonna get you that in like yesterday, yeah? Or no, make that eight figure because the seven figure is so yesterday's news, right? <laughs> and then, <laughs> so, you know, so the story has all of these ingredients, you know, that appeal to how we fall, you know, for, for false empty talk, you know, empty talk, empty promises or threats, you know, because there are superstitious people, gullible people, like the peasants in the story, you know, not very, uh, um, not very flattering to their own identity, you know. So they they are so superstitious that when the cat says the greatest misfortune will befall you, then that happens, right? So they believe it, you know. So of course they just they just on dictation they they just deliver the line that the cat already gave them. So you know, and so it goes. So you know, to, so I'm thinking like, man. Uh, that is like the less noble manifestation of the morale of this uh, of the moral of the story right when we can just uh, look around and say holy schmoly i mean the bullshit that surrounds us is so thick <laughs> however you see they what you can take away even as a seven year old from the story is that critical thinking so what it taught me it was like to be aware of the bullshit, empty talk that surrounds me on a daily basis. On a good note, what the story also teaches us is this notion of um, how efficient or beneficial it is to actually engage with this kind of discourses, you know, like fake it till you make it, just fake it till you make it, you know. <laughs> and then we get to that point where you realize ever so true the ones that also came up with this other line you know nothing succeeds like success if you present yourself as a success story if your name is attached to some ritual yeah <laughs> or the benefactor here you know is sending you the good game that you can enjoy and eat and then the king relates that with your name and then now you have a good reputation and even though there is no reality behind any of this you know it becomes reality yeah. right so in that sense, I see the story as like the master blueprint, you know, if you like, for all of the stuff that we call magic, you know, <laughs> all of the stuff that we call magic. Of course, inherently, what the other thing that it has, which is the more nasty aspect of it, is that if it teaches you critical thinking, then you will be developing this um, intolerant uh, uh, attitude towards bullshit precisely you know because you'll be able to spot it you will be able to deconstruct it on the uh, deconstruct it on the spot as well and then you'll be able to uh, hold in contempt that which is contemptible yeah so for all the claims these days that well you have to accept me as i am you have to love me i love me as all these entitlements you know <laughs> i just sit around and i'm like you know what i used to love reading uh, the master cat story, Puss in Boots. I mean, why don't you pull that shit on somebody else? <laughs> because I'm not interested in buying it, you know. So, so I, I totally, I totally love the story, and in fact, I love it so much that I return to it in, in, um, in, in all sorts of other contexts. You know, I did, uh, just uh, recently I completed a, a manuscript um, where I talk about goetic stories. You know, demons, the demons of the Goetia. I would focus on the seventy-second demon Andromalius, and then I have some Lucifer stories there. And then guess who? Guess who? Guess who makes an appearance? You know, the master cat. <laughs> So I thought, you know, so when you say, what's your favorite story? And then at first I thought, oh, I can't answer that. I don't, I don't know. I mean, you just saw my books and this is just a small sample, right? So, uh, but then in the context of magic, I thought this is it, you know, and I, I even just mentioned it, you know, so I thought I, I have to, I have to fling this on the, 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 the you have it. Yeah. So, you know, it's a recipe for how you perform magic. It's a recipe for how you 
succeed at addressing people well provided of course if you have the less than noble aim if you just give if the aim is just to be greedy you know <laughs> then all you need to do is find somebody who's stupider than you right and then and then it works then then you just pull all the lies on them you know and then you realize wow lying gets you wealth you know so uh but the, but the other thing is you know it teaches you something about the power of how we visualize ourselves in in certain bodies in certain embodiments and insofar as um you know the self is always a performance i mean where is this real thing that or the authentic or the transparent i mean like spare me the bullshit again um uh, so you know we are always performing you know so and what we perform is is exactly that which we find as part of our human condition you know and that's why some i return i keep returning to these immortal stories the romanian sepovesti nemuritoare so it's immortal stories. And I would I would say they got that right. You know, they never die. I mean, yes. look at me talking about Straparola's story 500 years after he wrote it, right? I mean, that's 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 something, you know. Wonderful. Yeah. Emilia, thank you so much for <laughs> <laughs> taking us on this on this journey of a well-known familiar of the cunning people and uh, to <clears throat> have an insight into how to write your own story in you and um, <laughs> with a bullshit detector, which is very much you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's fun because, you know, it's like there's so many and you can contrast these, you know, and I don't know, you, you said the stories and, and I thought if I mentioned this, should I mention others? There's so many. But, you know, so the, uh, I used to have a, a preference for the cunning stories because I was always interested in looking at what kind of strategies uh, the characters would come up with what kind of tactics they would engage with, you know, like lot. What's the logic behind it? I mean, it's absolute uh, masterpieces, right? At the same time, you know, I also remember that I love to read the opposite, you know, of the cunning stories where you have characters that are simply so idiotic that you know, <laughs> that is, but but in their idiocy, they are also so endearing, and you also learn something about the same human condition that we know because you know sadly we can't always be as masterful as we may aim and and we always find ourselves in foolish uh, situations so for, so for this you know I, I might mention Italo Calvino's Cosmic Comic or Cosmic Comics you know the Marco Valdo stories I don't know if people are are, are familiar with those so, so another Italian for some reason I don't know I must be with the Italians today <laughs> <laughs> the Italian fairy stories, they have this quality of being very uh, down to earth. Uh, you can relate so easily. They, they are, there's so much human in all their flaws. And, and yeah. Yeah, 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 I love them. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So, so ultimately, it comes down to, you know, like um, learning a few, learning to observe, you know. So I think that what, what the, these stories gave me and they still give me, is the capacity to notice what's happening you know how what's happening how do we navigate uh situations can we even distinguish between the different contexts that we are with you know like for instance i actually had to turn my brain so, so which one should i pick and then i thought are you a dumb or i said to myself <laughs> <laughs> there is a context you want something about magic and i thought yes okay if that's the case then i have it so you know so so how we develop the, the the sense of distinction, you know, I think I'm, I don't have any children, so, you know, but if I did have any, then I would have insisted, even if they didn't themselves had a uh, preponderance, let's say, for reading, you know, or, or an inclination towards reading, I would have absolutely forced them to sit there and read, <laughs> read these things, you know, so, and, and sometimes... Telling a story like oral is one thing, uh, but then the reading us, I think what did it for me was reading. I mean, and you let me hold this thing. I mean, look at this. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's so, so touching to, to imagine you have, yeah. that's the thing you brought with you on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> of all the things. <laughs> escaping uh, the regime. It, yeah. uh, that's. A layer in itself to the story that how important it, stories are that we yeah. take them with us yeah it couldn't have been better told camelia thank, thank you so you much, so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's all stories but some are better than others let's 
also remember that some stories are better than others yeah. and the, the more immortal they are the better you know because that's when you realize that they remain classic they remain relevant and you can identify you know uh, the genius of, of authorship you know or what a, another human being was capable of thinking and their ingenuity you know you can still identify it and see it in action like these days you know as i said like one was i mean just look around and i'm sure everybody can spot the the, the bullshit that we are being served as we speak you know <laughs> and it's yes. very similar to what we find in these immortal stories so you yes. know so i always say man read some stories yeah yeah <laughs> camelia this has been an absolute pleasure i'm looking forward to talk with you again and in the meantime, have a great time. Thank you so much. This was very fun. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The, the world Bye. is magical. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.